One year ago today, July 15th, 2016, it was a day where the fate of a nation was hanging in the balance. Hello and welcome to TRT World's special coverage of the attempted coup. And throughout the day here on TRT World, we'll be looking back at that day and how the events of that day unfolded, the scars it left on the people, how a nation stood up in defiance and how the events of that night could have changed the course of the country. Now, Turkey is no stranger to military coups. There have been several in the past and near takeovers as well, six times to be exact since 1960. But July 15th, 2016 was a day when the Turkish people said no more. Let's get right into it and introduce our first guest of our special coverage, Professor Mehmet Özkan. He's the rector of Boğaziçi University and he joins us now here in Istanbul. Professor, thank you very much for joining us. You're going to help us understand what happened that day and what it meant for the country. But I want to start off by asking you, where were you there, where you were that day and your earliest memories? Well, first, uh, thank you for having me here. Uh, before I start, I'd like to express my gratitude for, to those who lost their lives that day, one year ago today, and the millions who took on the streets and stand up against that uh, coup attempt. Uh, without them, actually, we wouldn't probably be celebrating today uh, the way we are celebrating our democracy, uh, so we should always remember them. Well, a year ago today, I was in Ankara, actually. I was uh, at a meeting at the Ministry of Science of, and Technology uh, regarding our university's issues. And uh, we were ha coming back happily from Ankara in the afternoon. And uh, about 8 p.m., uh, we arrived uh, in Istanbul, uh, and I was heading to my home. But I noticed, actually, something a little bit unusual because there were more security than usual on the streets and I thought first maybe that's because some important person or a foreign visitor was coming uh, from the airport so that's why and uh, I didn't really associate it with so something. So quite early on you realized something yes, was not yes. something out of the normal. Yeah, I think it was not very normal that day and I asked the taxi driver what's happening is someone important coming and he said Nothing that he knew of, but uh, he said that is more or less the same since 4 p.m. He said that I didn't really have any way of interpreting it. And of course, I was a bit tired, went back home. And about an hour later or so, we started hearing the news that the tanks were on the bridges and uh, something was happening. Everybody was trying to explain what's going on uh, without actually trying to associate it with, the, with any kind of coup attempt because that was past history for us, actually, mm -hmm. uh, left in 1980s, so we were not expecting anything like that. We had a strong government, legitimately elected, democratically elected. So uh, it wasn't something uh, anybody expected, but then all the signs were adding up, you know. It was a coup attempt, uh, unfortunately, uh, after we discovered that. Uh, and, uh, of course, we tuned on to the stations, TV stations, uh, both in Turkey and abroad. We're going to get a lot more, but let's actually, let's remember those events. Right around the time that you were flying from Ankara to Izmir, at around 8.23 p.m. in that evening, a group of 33 Turkish soldiers belonging to the Special Elite Forces convened at a Air Force base just outside of the nation's capital. There, their intention was to take over the general staff headquarters. And soon after that, we saw tanks roll up on the bridge you see behind me, and F-16 fighter jets were dispersed across Turkey's cities. Andrew Hopkins takes a look back at how the Night of Defiance unfolded. Remember the dead here at the police special forces headquarters in Ankara? More than 50 people were killed here when F-16 fighter jets opened fire and fighting broke out. This officer managed to escape with his life, after a piece of shrapnel hit him in the chest. Six months later, he finally managed to return to work. In my opinion, this wasn't a coup attempt. It was an invasion. Because normally in a coup, a government falls and another is formed. But they wanted us to become like Syria or Iraq. And if it was successful, things would not have got better. Inside the headquarters, there's an exhibition to commemorate those who died. Weapons melted in the heat of battle are lined up on shelves, alongside broken phones and keys of those who were killed. This is what the area looked like last year after the fighting. 
an officer's dormitory with its walls blown out, rooms reduced to piles of dust and rubble. This is what the site looks like now. All traces of the dormitory have been cleared away, but the events of last year on July the 15th are still clear in the minds of many people. It started as troops took over two bridges crossing the Bosphorus. And as it became clear a coup was taking place, airstrikes were carried out on government buildings, including Parliament, and at the police special forces headquarters in Ankara. Soldiers occupied state media, but politicians tried to rally the people. The president, on holiday in the Aegean, called a private TV channel via social media. This is an attempt by a minority within our armed forces. It's supported by the parallel movement in the state. I believe that they will be punished through the nation's unity and solidarity. People took to the streets, fighting back against the coup. And the president escaped by minutes from an armed group sent to capture him. Soon after, the Turkish armed forces announced they were back in control. The soldiers behind the coup surrendered. The people had won and Turkey had been changed forever. That was TRT World's Andrew Hopkins reporting for us in Ankara. I want to turn back to Professor Mehmet Özkan now. When you and I were talking, you described the 15th of July as the saddest day of your life. Why? Right, right. Actually, as we realized, actually, this was a coup attempt. It was a military takeover. Uh, when we started watching it on the TV, we saw live the destruction of the people. We saw tanks uh, deployed onto people, helicopters hovering opening fires, people were dying before our eyes, eyes and I was really down. It was really the saddest day of my life and uh, all our friends, all our family we were in tears and uh, there was a moment of hopelessness actually. And uh, we didn't expect it that because we, we overcome so many difficulties as a nation. We, we proved our democracy is now more resilient and stronger. So that was not supposed to happen, and it, however, was happening. So we really didn't know how to get out of it uh, until we heard the uh, speech from our prime minister, uh, uh, Yildirim. And uh, that was the moment when we started to have some hopes because he was uh, in charge and he was saying, this is a coup attempt, OK, but we are in control and we are going to bring the people before justice, uh, whoever did that will pay for it. And that was really the turning point. Then we started to gain our hopes back. And, and soon after the Prime Minister Bin Ali Yildirim's call, there came, after shortly after midnight, President Recep Tayyip sure. Erdogan's call. And shortly after President Recep Tayyip Erdogan's call on FaceTime, millions of people poured out in the streets. There was actually many people had their own stories, but one woman in particular who stood in the face of defiance in front of the soldiers. And here's her story. I saw on the news that they had closed off the Bosphorus Bridge. I immediately turned off the TV, put on some warm clothes and prepared my backpack. It was dead quiet outside. All the shops were closed. I walked through the streets of Chengelkoy and headed towards the bridge. When I got there, I walked straight to the barricade and asked the soldiers why they had closed it off, but they didn't answer. I told them that I wasn't going anywhere. They then threatened to shoot me. One soldier even pointed his gun at my face and then fired a shot into the air. I felt the sparks fall on my head. But I looked at him and said, you can't scare me with that. The soldiers were livid. I saw the rage in their eyes. Realizing I couldn't speak any sense into them, I turned back towards the crowd of people waiting at the other end of the bridge. But as I was walking, the soldiers opened fire at the crowd and I was on my way to help an injured woman when I got shot in the leg. Here 
gördükleri yerde yollarda durdurup sarılıyorlar. After that night when people saw me, they stopped and hugged me. They cried and thanked me. We are sad only for our martyrs and for the children who are still looking for their lost mothers and fathers. If it happened again, I would do the same thing. How can one's heart, conscience and mind stand silent when your country is in danger? Dozens of stories like that. I want to turn back to our guest now, Professor Mehmet Özkan. Uh, Professor, uh, why do you think this coup was defeated? Undoubtedly, the turning point of the events was the call from our president. So his stand and his uh, strength reflected onto the people and they, they took onto the streets and they defied this coup attempt very strongly. That showed actually the people of Turkey were not the same people of Turkey 20, 30 years ago. We went through a lot of things and we proved we, we gained our dignity, we gained our confidence, self-confidence within the last de decade actually, last one or two decades. And because uh, we were not the same people, it is not really only the technology, the telecommunications and everything, it is the people that change in time and we, we became more aware who we are actually. We come from a civilization that was never colonized before. We, freedom for these people is life. So without freedom, we know that we cannot survive. It is, it is our, in our hearts and it is in our, in our mind and everything. So we know that if we are not free, we are not who we are, so. What do you think some of the lessons that Turkey has learned uh, from July 15, 2016? Well, no matter how strong we became, we learned that we are still under risk. So the threat is not over. So that means uh, we shouldn't be so overconfident, actually. There are things to be done. There are lessons to be learned. And one lesson I think we should strongly uh, take out from this event, appointing people by merit is a key issue. So whatever institution we are at, we must make sure that the people we are working with are there because of their skills, their merit, and their open-mindedness, their open-heartedness, and their good conscience. So we must establish these kind of uh, establishments, and we must institu institutionalize our uh, uh, facilities, our uh, whatever uh, you know company or university we are working it we must maintain that otherwise it can easily be taken over if somebody with some bad intention is controlling our staff our people some very important messages thank you very much for joining us here on church world that was professor mehmet oskam from Boston university